and welcome. I'm in New Delhi this week to meet my guest and beautiful people. Now, when a journalist decides to write his memoir, you can bet there'll be some juicy stories. And when that journalist is Vinod Mehta, the editor-in-chief of the Outlook Group and uh, someone who edited the Debonair, the Sunday Observer, the Indian Post, the Independent and the Pioneer's Delhi edition en route to getting to the Outlook, you can hope that he won't pull his punches. In a time when there is intense scrutiny on the media and great interest in the media, this book Lucknow Boy, a memoir, is interesting read or a good read for journalists, for the subjects of journalism, as well as the readers or the audience of journalism. Mr. Mehta, lovely to have you on Thank this you. show. Sure. I am a Mumbaikar, born okay. and brought up as they say, okay. but I dare say that people from Lucknow will approve of the book because it's funny, it's irreverent, and I think that it's definitely not boring. Uh. Thank you. Thank is, you. Is, is that the feedback you're getting? I am not compulsive in my sense of holding the audience, but I, I don't want anyone to say that, oh God, yawn and read this book. I mean, if they said I didn't find it interesting, I don't mind. Mm -hmm. But I, the idea of somebody saying, oh God, this is getting a bit much, and put it aside, that would be... A, a fate worse than death. Yes, I, 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 because uh, <laughs> I've had an interesting life, mm -hmm. and therefore why shouldn't I write it interestingly? Why should I write it boringly? Mm -hmm. I mean, some people have said the book has got scandal and gossip and all these things. Mm -hmm. Well, life is full of scandal and gossip. I mean, especially if you're a journalist, all the time, every morning when I go to work, I hear in my editorial conference, before we get down to the agenda, I hear a lot of scandal and gossip, who's sleeping with whom, <laughs> which politician has made money, and all, which politician is thinking of switching sides. So one is constantly on the receiving end of this, and therefore, why shouldn't the book reflect some of this? Because gossip, you see, is not unimportant in politics because much i mean look at sonia so gandhi's point, sonia it? gandhi's illness for yeah, example yeah. we had no official word on yeah. it and yet i think most people have a fair idea mm. of what something what is wrong with her and mm. i think that is partly because of of buzz or gossip or whatever you call it. So I think gossip gets a bad press. I think it's not such a bad thing, actually. What I find interesting is when I read the book, that in the early years, which is your childhood, adolescence, and you right up to when you were 20, 21, you were in Lucknow. Mm -hmm. And uh, you seem to have a fun, almost feckless life, isn't yeah, it? Very yeah. cavalier, casual. Yeah, yeah. You had a good time yeah, growing up. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there wasn't this burning passion to be a journalist, you didn't study it. Even when you went to London, yeah. you spent uh, almost a decade there uh, yeah. without really formally trying to be a journalist, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, but in my London years, hmm. uh, you say I, my life in Lucknow was cavalier, perhaps too cavalier. And therefore, when I went to London and I mm. saw the big wide world in front of me, mm. I realized what an ignoramus I was. I knew nothing about the world. Mm. And th that, not just about India. I knew nothing about India. I knew nothing about the world. Mm. So I set upon a campaign or a project of self-education. Self so there's a book, there's a thing called Educating Rita. Mm. They, I, so I was involved in educating Vinod. And I had to become, begin right at the bottom because I didn't know anything except basic fundamentals. And that ignorance made me feel very insecure in the beginning because I'd read a newspaper. As and I you wouldn't know the context? I, I would know. I'd see the Cuba missiles, you know, there's a world my the Russians might fire missiles. And I said, what the hell is this? Or oh, Marilyn Monroe is committed suicide. So I would say, this woman who's so beautiful, who's sleeping with all presidents and all this kind of thing, why would she commit suicide? I think a lot of journalists, a lot of young people will find that in a sense reassuring that, you know, you can make up for no, you can having be a good time. You can be absolutely, you can be an absolute idiot like me. And you, if you get, if you try and you work, but you first must accept you're an idiot. Hmm. I mean, you shouldn't pretend you're not. Mm. I had no problems in accepting the fact that I was abysmally uninformed. Mm. And therefore I said, this has to be corrected. I can't live in this world. I can't live in London without being a, so ignorant and everything. I mean, I'd be I wouldn't sometimes read the paper in the morning mm. because I thought, my God, what new thing is going to be thrust on me? Mm. 
So I was, I came, as I say, I came close to self-loathing. I said, what a fool I have been. Yeah, I mean, I had a good time in Lucknow, but surely that is not the purpose of life. Would this conclusion be valid that people who go on to be journalists and eminent editors don't necessarily have to be terribly educated or well informed or even, uh, you know, clear about the path they want to take? In fact, is there hope for all those journalists who our press council chairman Markande Karju has questioned in terms of their intellectual abilities and education? Well, you know, in those days, there were two routes to journalism. Mm. Uh, senior, in the times of India, these chaps came back from Oxford and Cambridge, 22, 23 years old, mm. so, Doon School. I mean, there was a route. Yeah, there, yeah, was, yeah. there was Doon School, yeah. St. Stephen's College, Oxford, assistant editor of Times yeah. of India. That's <laughs> the way, that, that was the navigation as the it were. pedigree, isn't it? Pedigree. Yeah. Now, of course, that route was not open, but I got this chance. Now, what the hell? I was going to grab it with both hands. Yeah. And what was I going to do? Well, I was going to learn about typography, design, editing, good mm -hmm. writing. So I said, I must learn all these. Mm -hmm. So I have an advantage over these people mm -hmm. who came straight and started writing editorials or mm -hmm. on Indo-Chinese affairs or something <laughs> like that. Whereas I, of course, had to do some of that also. Mm -hmm. But I had to do all the other dirty stuff. You know, you're a Dillywala. Mm. Uh, it's easy to forget that you spent close to 20, 25 uh, years uh, and uh, worked with four publications yeah. when based in Bombay. So when you look at what's happened to Bombay now, you think it's good you got away when you did? Well, you know, I was in the Bombay of the 70s and the 80s. And it was, I described some of that. It was yeah. a great place to yes. be. Yeah. The ships and I had yeah. come in, hadn't spread its poison. Mm. Uh, there were wide roads, there were mm. interesting Parsis who were, used to mm. embrace trees and mm. all kind of cranks over there. People came because mm. they wanted to make it good. They, they, it, it was the city of gold as it mm. was called. Mm. And everybody felt that they had a chance. Mm. It was like a roulette wheel. If you worked hard enough, you had a chance. I am a prime example yeah. of that myself. Yeah. It doesn't matter where you come from. Come from. You, know, you can a, go anywhere. I'm a Punjabi from Lucknow. Yeah. Uh, I had a chance. And mm. the city, you know, what happened was, I tell you the difference between Bombay and Delhi. Bombay celebrates at that time success. Mm. Delhi celebrates failure. When I lost my job in many of the papers in Bombay, I would find people coming to me on the road and they'd pat me on the back mm -hmm. and say, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, you'll get another paper, you'll get another paper, you are a good chap, you, you'll do okay. When I came to Bombay, I find Delhi, I found people loved nothing else but talking about this chap has gone down the tube, this chap has fa failure excited. People don't want to see another successful person in Delhi. When one goes through the book, uh, you have described your stints as editor in all these places, starting with Debonair and, you know, today at the Outlook Group as editor-in-chief. But in between, uh, when you talk about these uh, different stints and the different publications that you started in many cases, like the Indian, uh, not the Indian Post, like the Independent and the Sunday Observer, you also talk about the relationship you had with your proprietors. Mm. Would I be right if I say uh, on reading this book that you were most forgiving of Vijay Pat Singhania as your proprietor and least so of L.M. Thapar? Well, you see, Vijay Pat Singhania had a particular problem which I was very sympathetic to. Hmm. That he, the newspaper constituted maybe 2% of his, his business. 98% was. And we were then living in this license permit Kota Raj. And he had a project in Naini, some polyester filament project. Hmm. And they were just not giving him, giving it mm. to him. And they said, you throw this paper in the Arabian Sea and we'll give it to you. Mm. So he actually asked me, he said, what would you do when he took yeah. me for lunch? Mm. He asked me this question. He said, what would you do if you were yeah, in, my in my place? And I couldn't give him an answer because I would probably have done the same thing. With L.M. Thapar, the problem was more, was different to the extent that he was a very urbane sort of man. But he was also a person who had a huge ego mm. and who was a bit of a darbari, you know. He liked yeah. co courtiers, courtiers around. around him. And I wasn't willing to become a courtier. Mm. But there was one other problem. You see, he ha was such a gregarious person. He knew everybody in Delhi. 
So from, people took it personally if his paper, which at that time was the pioneer, pioneer. that you were editing. So Mala, yeah, from yeah. Mala Singh yeah. to Kamal Nath to mm. bureaucrats. Now I had told him that if you start a paper, mm. you will have to offend somebody almost on a daily basis because a new paper has to find space for itself. Mm. So we just can't say good things about everybody and hope to get on. Mm. And every morning one of his friends in the papers mm. would be traduced. So I used to be petrified, I'd look at the paper and I'd say if we criticize somebody and I said this is a bloody friend of L.M. Thapar and sure enough that chap would, 11.30 would have called Thapar so and, and Thapar then didn't realize, he thought that this paper would make him new friends. <laughs> Actually, it lost him lots of friends and I think in the end he gave in to that. He thought it would make him socially and politically very powerful. Yeah, yeah. But I kept banging into him when we, before we started mm. that we will annoy people, we will offend people. You so, lose friends, you will not make friends. I come back to my question. Were you more forgiving of Vijay Pat Singhania no, and less so. of L.M. Thapar? I think so, I think so. Because Vijay Pat had a much better reason for closing down his paper than L.M. Thapar, who only had his personal friendships. Okay. Uh, there are two other uh, two other proprietors we need to talk about. One is uh, Samir Jain, mm. uh, of the mega, vast, um, um, you know, much maligned and much envied Bennett mm. & Coleman or the mm. Times of India group. Uh, let's quickly talk about your, your stint there, because uh, what is interesting to me is that you seem to suggest in your book, when you were I editing The Independent, that uh, a journalist could do his or her work there with uh, pretty much no in interference. Well, you see, he was not what he was interested in the commercial side of mm. the business. Mm. Actually, I never had a political conversation with him ever. I had mm. some with his father, who's mm. now not there, Ashok Jain, mm. but politics didn't interest him. Mm. He was interested in how he could make this paper commercially viable. He had the Times of India, and but you see, he wanted a niche paper, which right at the yeah, top, yeah. so that if you were selling some Tag Hua watches or some uh, Swiss watches, mm -hmm. you didn't want the whole readership of the Times of India, yeah. your advertiser. It was a complete waste. You wanted that top creamy layer as it were right. so and he wanted the independent to be that creamy layer once you understood that this was his business objective or commercial reason for the mm -hmm. reasoning for this new paper you were pretty much left alone to do what you wanted I to. think I think I was left pretty much alone to do what I wanted mm -hmm. but on the understanding mm -hmm. that Samir Jain doesn't like the old style editor who pretends mm -hmm. to be very powerful all-knowing mm -hmm. I mean, I was very much aware that I was working in an organization where the editor was important, but the proprietor was much, much more important. I had to accept the mm. fact that he is the boss mm. and that where one incident when uh, we used to have meetings in the morning sometimes and all the managers used to take notes. So I got a message saying Mr. Samir Jain likes you a lot, mm. but he finds you're the only guy who's not <laughs> taking notes. So I immediately took a little pad and paper, but I think he noticed that I was not taking notes of what he was saying, but I was doodling, you know. So, what, I, think, so <laughs> I think journalists need to note that you need to pick the battles you want yeah, to fight, Yeah, you it? want to. Mr. Mehta, we are talking in a week when Sharad Pawar was assaulted, was slapped by, uh, by an individual. You have had two exchanges with him. In fact, one was, uh, you know, one cost you your job and mm. ha saw the independent then die a, yeah. a, a death, the, the yeah. paper that you launched for Bennett and Coleman. Uh, and much later on at the Outlook, where I believe uh, you were sued and the yes. group was sued it's for a hundred crore rupees. It's all there in the book and that's where, you know, that's where yeah. I've read it. What was your reaction this week when you heard about this incident? Physical violence is it's completely ab abhorrent. I mean, you, you don't use physical violence. You don't say to somebody, mm. uh, you go, don't beat him up. So you just put that out of the equation. I mean, there's no question of that. Mm. But I think that there is a lot of anger in, in, um, in ordinary people amongst ordinary citizens. Mm. And the anger is that some of these people are doing actually quite well. Mm. I mean, they're financially all right. I mean, they're rather more than financial, mm. but the element of greed in them mm. is so compulsive 
that uh, they, they just don't know when to stop. I would like justice to come to these people through other means. Mm -hmm. I prefer the kind of justice that Mr. Raja is facing at the moment today, mm -hmm. which is within the law. They have broken the law and the law must catch them. At the moment, there seems to be one law for you and me and one law for them. The independent paper that you launched uh, uh, for Bennett and Coleman, uh, you said one of the reasons, there were two factors that led to its closing down. One clear factor was that you got a story wrong. And unlike most journalists, when I got it wrong, I paid the price. I said, yeah. I, I have to pay the price and I quit. Mm. So that is it. But you also suggest in your book that it was not just about getting that story wrong. It was about the fact that other publications and the editors of, let's say, the Times of India, at that time Dilip Padgaonkar and uh, maybe the editor of Maharashtra Times, uh, at, uh, to, together seem to f resent you and your team at the oh, Independent. I, there's no question about that. And you as see, a result, I described when, when we joined stop, the paper, they the, wouldn't give us any tea. Yeah. There was a strike. They, the so, t Times of India was dead against the idea of starting Padgonkar and were, right. hated the idea that independent was started in the first place. Right. And, 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 and you say that they stoked the violence that yeah. you saw, uh, you know, um, yeah. some of the uh, supporters of uh, Mr. Vaibhi Ch uh, Chavan and in Maharashtra and, and Sharad Pawar supporters. Pawar. That was your first yeah. interaction, with, first with brush it. with Sharad yeah, Pawar, is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I go further than just saying I, two days, for two days when the story was printed, mm. there was some reaction, but mm. not too much about. Mm. And I think we would have got away with it, with an apology. Mm. But then the Times of India and the Maharashtra Times mm. started a campaign in which one editorial that was written in the Times of India said that if physical violence is meted out to me, I would have deserved it. So they orchestrated a campaign and then I think Sharad Pawar got into because mm -hmm. he thought he was Vaibhi Chavan's chela. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bal Thakare is not to be left behind. Everybody got. But it was possible or it was going the way that there was some anger and outrage. But mm -hmm. for two days, after two days it had died. Mm -hmm. so two days later mm -hmm. it was stoked again. Right. You have obviously opined about a lot of different people you've met. In yeah. fact, you end the book for people who want to know what you think of Sonia Gandhi, Shobha Day, yeah. and everybody else in between, you know, people like that. You've, you've written about them especially at the end of the book. Yeah. But uh, what I find interesting is that uh, this bit that you've written when you're talking about the experience at The Independent, and I'm quoting from your book, you say, I hold no grudges against Dilip Padgaonkar. He is who he is. However, the man who once claimed he held in quotes, the second most important job in the country can be legitimately charged with single-handedly opening the door for the denigration and decline of the editor as an institution. When Dilip's bosses asked him to bend, he crawled. Since then, it has been downhill all the way for other editors. I think this, uh, though you've said, uh, you know, you've said lots of different things about different people. I found this perhaps uh, where I got a sense that this is something that hurt Vinod Mehta the most, and therefore you were, you know, you're well, most trenchant in your criticism. By the campaign. Mm, mm. But I, lo I'm constantly being asked mm. that what about the great institution of the editor? Yeah. And there is, again, I mean, there's hardly a secret that it is declined, mm. that the power of the editor and the authority of the editor is not what it was, say, 25 years ago. You look at what Frank Moraes and Giri Lalja and mm. people in the Times itself. Mm. So the editor is now a little pygmy. Mm. And I think that it was Dilip Pitgaonkar in the Times of India who was so keen to placate and please and ingratiate himself with the proprietor mm. that if they asked him to go one mile, he went three miles. Mm. Uh, that was the way that he thought he would keep his job secure. So it's and then people kept saying, and you see the Times of India in many ways is a model for everybody in marketing terms also. Yeah, you know, know absolutely. Better. So when the Times of India treats its editors like this and the editor accepts it cheerfully, that's the important thing then it sets a model for everybody else. And I think that was the, my main grouse. Mm. And it made people like me, I could never get a job in a paper. For example, people always ask me, why didn't you get a job after the Pioneer in a daily paper? Mm. I said, no daily paper would have given me a job because someone like me wouldn't fit into the matrix mm. that had been created by the Lippert Gonkar and others. I couldn't have been that kind of editor. I would, I mean, if I had tried, 
in six months I would have quit. Mm. So it's fair to say that you all are not friends, you and the Lipper. Oh, right? I had dinner with him a couple of days. Oh, we are friends, but he knows who he is and he probably doesn't like me. And what was his reaction to this, uh, to this opinion? You haven't met okay. I hope I don't. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Mehta, let's talk about uh, some of the politicians, especially one key politician, and that is Sonia Gandhi. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting that, uh, you know, you defend the fact that you've been criticized for being a Sonia Chamcha by saying that, hey, look, if I don't like some politicians, I'm going to end up hating all humanity, mm -hmm. right? right? So being a misanthrope. She is somebody you like, and these kind, th this kind of liking is instinctive. Is that is that how one interprets well, it? Well, you see, instinctive maybe. Because there are a lot of questions that are really, unanswered, which you yourself will acknowledge. That there are lots of inconsistencies and contradictions in my support mm. for Sonia Gandhi and the Congress Party. But you see, at the end of the day, there are two parties that one has to choose from. One is the BJP and one is the Congress. Mm. I can't say that I am going to be a supporter of the Samajwadi Party because it's meaningless. Two national mm. parties. Mm. Now, the BJP I have problems with, mm. uh, not their politics so much, but their communal agenda. That I, because as I describe, I'm a yeah. pseudo-secularist yeah. from Lucknow, how mm. could I sort of mm. Now, then the Congress I have some problems with, but by and large, I find them certainly preferable to the BJP. Mm. And by and large, they don't believe in caste and they don't believe in religion, religious politics. By and large, I say, they, although they pay obeisance to both. They, they, they bend to both. Mm. Therefore, I am willy nilly more drawn to them because they are sort of talk of secularism and this kind of thing. So I wish I had a third option, mm. but having only two options, mm. I support. And although I say this, that if you support Sonia Gandhi, you have to support a very dangerous notion which is of dynastic succession. I think you have to take, and I admit that you that's the minus point of supporting her. There are some plus points and there are minus points. But this on this dynastic succession, you can't deny that. Yes, it's part of the Congress culture. Leads me to another question, and that is that it's important to to like a few people. Otherwise, Absolutely. it just would be you damn up, difficult you, in this As business, I said, you it? know, you, you, you end up as a misanthrope. Mm. You start hating humanity. Mm. And, I, and I'm generally, uh, I like people. I mean, I don't want to be a contrarian I don't want to keep fighting with people, etc. Mm -hmm. And therefore, politically, you have to be on some side. You can't say, I'm on nobody's side. Mm -hmm. There has been a great interest in the media for a while now. But there is greater scrutiny and criticism of the media, even amongst you know, viewers or readers, uh, in the past year or so. Um, definitely over the past two years and especially since the Radia tapes came out. Um, was that a difficult decision to publish the Radia oh, tapes? Oh, very, very difficult decision for two, three reasons. Mm. One was that very big corporate chiefs were involved mm. and though our commercial interests would be hit if we yeah. published that mm. and actually they were hit. So mm. my fears were justified mm. that after the tapes. Then there were people in my own profession, people mm. I liked, people I knew, who were p part of collateral damage, mm. but they were they had to be exposed. Mm. And the third reason was that you know you generally take on people. People say that you are printing private mm. conversations, etc. That's mm. not good. But in my 35 years of editor, I have not come across a story mm. which, when I saw it first, it was of such compelling public interest. Mm that whatever my reservations, I said this has to see the light of day. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it gives us a peek into Indian democracy and how it functions. Mm -hmm. How cabinet positions are being talked about like Mumbai that, oh, you can't give me this, oh, I'll take that. No, no, you can't take that. You take this. Okay, I'm going to speak to X. And I mean, it's squalid, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it's true. It happened. Mm -hmm. So I think we had to tell it. And in the process, make a lot of uh, enemies and in the process harm the commercial interest of my the Tatas by the way mm -hmm. just knocked us out out of everything mm -hmm. and we had to pay a big price for that but as I said when I saw the story I said this is too important this is too big. The interesting thing is that that material was actually available for quite some time with a lot of media houses, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, there were reservations about putting it out in the first instance because mm -hmm. it seemed to come from 
a corporate house with clear vested interests, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I write about it. Yeah, yeah. So, so my point is that, um, so there was some time to come to this decision to put it out. Well, you see, I put it out when Prashant Bhushan mm. went to the yeah, Supreme when it came out, Court. Yeah. And he attached this, this is a yeah. CD that was attached yeah. along with his petition yeah. to the Supreme Court. Then it became legitimate. Right. Uh, it had that not happened, would you say? No, I would not have carried it. We had okay. the stuff, as you yeah, say. Yeah. And in fact, some of my fellow editors got to know about mm. it and kept asking me, mm. are you going to use this stuff? Mm. And I said, no. But once the Supreme Court had it, the petition was there, Raja was raided, mm. and the CD was attached. So I only printed the CD that was attached with the petition in the Supreme Court. Without that, of course, I had no it had no legitimacy. I would never have carried it if we had not got that CD. Today, Neera Radia has um, formally exited uh, the uh, you know the, the PR business. Mm. Um, she don't no longer handles either Mukesh Ambani's business or um, the Tata Group's mm. business. Mm. Um, Barkha Dutt is uh, still a very key figure in the Indian Indian media. Veer Sangvi, we don't know where he is really, though I see his columns once in a while in the brunch. How do you think some of these two, three individuals came off it? I'm not talking about the politicians and the corporate guys because you know they are. They, they, there is some legal process that's on, where they are concerned. Well, as far as the journalists are concerned, I mean, I, they are upset. They are angry with me. They think I targeted them. I tried to explain. I met Barkhadas at one party one day after the tapes had come out, and I tried to explain to her. That I, it was she was not the main target. Mm. The main target was these mm. other You're people. Saying it's collateral damage. Collateral right. damage. Mm. But I don't think she understood. I, I think that's she, at a personal level. But do you? No, but it harmed mm. her professionally. She felt that I had harmed her, mm. not just personally but mm. professionally, because her credibility was at mm. stake. Mm. And therefore, she felt that I was responsible for uh, some erosion in her credibility. But do you think? Given the way the Indian public is and the Indian media consuming public, do you think we have long memories when it comes to credibility of journalists? I think in this matter, because the tapes were of such a mm. sensational quality mm. and because certain media personalities assume a larger than life persona, mm. people remember them, especially if they appear on TV. Mm. They come mm. every day into your bedroom. Mm. And if they have a, also a persona of being completely correct and clean and mm. trying to trying to correct the system and every day talk about other people's corruption, mm. and they themselves are caught in some hanky panky, then I think it, it people remember that people remember that, and uh, it'll take some time for people to mm. forget. But I think it's it's been two years now since it happened. And we're still talking and it's about not, it. We're still talking mm. about mm. it. Uh, talking about TV and the larger than life persona that people, pe journalists on TV have, uh, you seem to be on TV almost every day. Too often. I Too think. often, you say yourself, and yet you're there. Do you enjoy the noise and the din? And is it just no? Fun you see, thing? I don't take TVs. First of all, you don't take TV seriously. I have a good time. I do it from. <laughs> <laughs> this place in my room, I don't take it too seriously, and I have a good time. But uh, maybe you're right. My wife also tells me that mm. I should curtail my TV appearances because I don't think I have anything very profound to say. But because I'm slightly irreverent, and because it doesn't matter if they don't call me, it doesn't matter mm. to me. It, it really doesn't matter. I'm being honest with you. Mm. If tomorrow morning, no, mm. for example, NDTV has banned me, mm. I don't appear there. Mm. I mean, I keep telling NDP TV people, thank you very much. Because I have now only two channels mm. to negotiate with. One is yours and the <laughs> other is uh, Times Now. If you don't take the medium seriously, why spend so much well, time? I, I think you protest too much. I no, think no, some I think you I'm, like it. Oh, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not vain. I'm not yeah. saying that I don't like when I go to the airport, somebody says to me, that, oh, we see you a lot on TV, and then they say, which hurts me really, mm. what do you do besides <laughs> preparing on And they don't know, have any idea that I've been a print editor for 35 years. That really hurts me, mm. because my, my, I'm really proud. I've, and you, mu you must give me one thing. Look, these days when everybody from mm. print is going and becoming an anchor, and I had so many opportunities, mm. I stuck to print. I, for one moment, mm. it, never crossed my mind that I should enter TV. 
I was determined that I started as a print editor mm -hmm. and I will die as a print editor. Through this book, and uh, it, it, there are lessons for journalists. Even even if there are not lessons directly, there are um, you know experiences that we can share at different levels. There are two things that you say towards the end that I find particularly interesting when it comes to uh, what journalists you know the, the the angst that journalists go through. One is, should can a story always have two sides, and should a journalist uh, stick to the facts? Or should they get into edit? edit should every journalist or no, reporter be I'm, an editor? Yeah, because I'm that's what to, news television is yeah, increasingly yeah, television doing. Television is there. What I am saying to you is this: that most story, stories have two sides or mm. three sides or four, whatever it is. Mm. But there are some stories which have only one side. Mm. I would say if I was covering the 2002 riots in Gujarat, mm. that would be only one side. Yeah. If I was doing 1984 mm. Sikh riots. If I am doing female feticide, mm. there is only one side. So sometimes when a journalist must follow his gut instinct, if you become a journalist, that doesn't mean you must sublimate your anger. Your anger should, in fact, you should keep your anger. The anger is the big thing in you which keeps you going, mm. which wants you to change society. Because why did we become journalists in the first place? Because we felt mm. that we want to change things. But if we were status quo, then we would have joined the LIC. If you wanted uh, just the status quo. The other question that bothers a lot of young journalists, should they be friends with their subjects, whether it's politicians or yeah. um, business people or whoever it is that, <coughs> or film stars or cricketers, whoever it is that they're covering. For instance, when you talk about Sonia Gandhi, you say very interestingly, the only favor you've ever asked her in your entire life is for her to grace, her, grace your 10 years of Outlook function, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. But when you ask people for favors, even if it is just this, please come and be the chief guest at our function, does that put you on the back foot no matter what when it, it comes to the stories you do? puts me on the back foot terribly. One of the things that I hate is asking politicians for any kind of favor. Mm. I think I love to do polit favors to politicians. Mm. But even that kind of favor I feel very uncomfortable with because I know that I will be asked to repay that favor 10 times back. Mm. So I think that we have to be very careful. You should be, have good relations with politicians. Mm. They shouldn't feel that you have a congenital mm. hostility towards them. Mm. But they cannot be friends in the term that you can have friends. I have four or five friends. But no politician is my friend because in the end, the politician will use you. My point is that increasingly magazines, um, television channels, you know, people do events, people do functions where they want these people to come and grace this. Yeah. Like, you know, the example I just gave you of your own. Uh, you you know, should you know, be able to I'm explain saying, to them, as I explained to, I write in this book that we did a story against Kamal Nath hmm. about some rice exports. Hmm. And when that story appeared, he rang me up and said, hmm. You've done this, but you're my friend. What did you say? I said nothing. I couldn't, didn't know, but I carried the story. Mm. I didn't say anything. I hope my silence explained to him that, yeah, I'm your friend, but I'm not going to stop my, the story is bigger than our friendship. Mm. Mr. Mehta, you begin this book by quoting someone who you hold in very high regard, both as a writer and a journalist, and that's George Orwell. You've quoted George Orwell as saying an autobiography is only to be trusted when it reveals something disgraceful. So, I have read most of Lucknow Boy. Mm. I couldn't pin down anything that was disgraceful well, I about what you what think I'm you've saying, done. What I was trying to say that life is victories and defeats. Mm. If you write a memoir for self-justification, mm. to say that you did everything right, mm. that there were no low points in your life, mm. that you didn't do anything wrong, uh, then that becomes quite, uh, that's not the purpose of writing a, a memoir. Mm. You must present your life in its complexity, in its, in its volatility. In my whole life has been up and down. Mm. Sometimes I've been up, sometimes I've been down. I hope I've described the downs as graphically as I've mm. described the ups. Mm. You've described in this book the fact that you may have a daughter I not, not me, I have. You have a daughter yeah. uh, who you don't know because when you fathered your daughter, you were a young man who couldn't get married and didn't want the responsibility of being a father, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Uh, this is when you were 20 21. Years old. Yes, you 20 were 20, 21 in England, isn't it? Is this the one thing you think you've told us about yes. you 
which gives us a sense of a failure or a failing or is well, it more about a sense of I, loss? I discussed it with my wife and mm. we thought, I, I said this is my last will and testament as it were. I have to get this off my chest. I can't keep living with this. And even if I behave badly, I must acknowledge the fact that I did bring another person into the world. And for reasons which I have described, I couldn't take responsibility for that person. I needed to get that off my chest. And I don't know what the end result will be. It would be a great gift to me if after this book, we somehow make I somehow make contact with her. Shouldn't be it be easy in the in the year twenty eleven to to find someone? A lot of people have told me that. A lot of people have told me that. I I have some idea where the mother lives, mm. the town in Switzerland. But beyond that, I know nothing. What do you plan to do about it? Well, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's. See. You see, the other pr the problem that I have, and my wife keeps warning me. That that girl, my daughter, is probably now well settled in life. If I intervene at this late stage, I don't know what they've told her about me. If I intervene at this late stage in her life, I don't know what kind of upheaval I will cause her life. Because I don't know what her parents have told her. I don't know whether she's married, she's got children. So for me, not to have been in her life and suddenly to reappear in her life mm. is also somewhat selfish from my point of view because I don't want to upset her norm normality of her life which I presume she has but even that why did you need to tell us this well because it's there and I've told things that I have never told her I stuck I asked my wife I consulted her she knew about it and I said should I not tell it mm. and I felt that since I'm being this is a memoir and I'm being as candid and honest and possible why should I hide anything? And if the reader at the end of the day thinks I'm a bastard, well, that's all right. Mm. I think I'm a, I, be, I myself say that I behaved badly. Mm. So I'm prepared to accept all blame for that. Mr. Mehta, we, you know, we wish you well. We Thank hope you. you go on this quest and you find her. It'll be, it'll be interesting because you're a fun man to know if nothing <laughs> else. I don't know about the upheaval, but at least it'll be fun. So thank you for yes, this lovely you. conversation. Talk, talk I wish you well. Nice. Thank you. Thank you.